Cast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Children's Cardiomyopathy Foundation's webinar, Supporting Your Diagnosed, Ch Diagnosed Child's Suggestions from a Patient. We're happy that you're joining us today for this session. Some housekeeping notes before we get begin. If at any point during the presentation you need technical assistance, please type your concern in the chat window. If you have any audio issues, you should be able to switch between your computer speakers and a phone if necessary. In order to provide the highest quality session today and avoid any background noise, all attendees are currently in the listen-only mode. Your questions are encouraged and welcome throughout the presentation. Questions can be submitted via the question box, which is located in the control panel. We'll reserve the last 10 to 15 minutes of the presentation for any questions. You're welcome to submit your questions throughout the presentation as you think of them, and we'll go through them at the conclusion of the talk. If the control panel is preventing you from seeing the complete slides, you can hide it by clicking the button with the small arrow to the left of the control panel. To redisplay the control panel, just click the button again. We'll also be recording this webinar, so we may offer it to those who are unable to attend live. It will be available on CCF's YouTube channel, CCF Heart Kids. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Um, we're thrilled to have Mike Papali as our webinar presenter. Mike is the president and founder of In a Heartbeat, a Connecticut-based nonprofit organization with a mission of, of preventing death from studying cardiac arrest and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. He is also the head boys basketball coach at Fairfield Prep. Prior to his work within a heartbeat, Mike spent time as an assistant men's basketball coach at UMass Lowell, Quinnipiac University, and Southern Connecticut State University. So with that, I am going to turn over um, the screen for Mike to present. Um, and there we go. Cool. All right, it looks like I'm, I'm ready to go. Is it, Great. <laughs> you can see it? Good. Yeah, okay. I can see it. Thanks, Mike, so much for being with awesome. us today. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, and thank you to the uh, Children's Cardi Cardiomyopathy Foundation for uh, letting me do this, because it's something I'm really, really passionate about. Um, and also for uh, giving patients like me and, and all of um, the other attendees out there an opportunity to have resources to um, to help them as they kind of navigate their life with heart disease, because um, it's something I'm going to talk about a lot in this presentation. But um, I just, I just really, really believe in in learning from um, other people that are living through similar things that um, you're living through and and, uh, and going to live through for for you know for the rest of your life, really. So, um, with that, um, the goal of this presentation, so. Heart disease diagnosis, no matter how it comes, um, and I, I'm going to get into my story and how I was diagnosed um, and, and, and that whole thing, but no matter how the diagnosis comes, it's scary and it causes a lot of mixed emotions, a lot of anxiety, a lot of fear, not just with the patient, um, but with the family as well. So the goal of what I'm talking about, and I've been a heart disease patient now for 14 years, um, I'm 31 years old, and I truly believe that Currently, I have a pretty normal life, and my goal is to share some resources that have helped me get to this point. Um, because it hasn't always been this way for me, um, but I've but I've learned a lot in the last 14 years. So again, the goal of this is to help you help your child live a very long and very normal life with heart disease. Because I truly believe that that is possible, um, even though it might not seem like it right now. So um, before I really uh, start talking about some of the different things I've uh, come across in my life as a heart disease patient. I just want to share my story and why I'm here presenting today. So growing up, um, you know, when I was a teenager, I was a basketball player and it was literally the only thing I did. I had no balance in my life whatsoever. Um, I was not into music. I wasn't into art. I wasn't into anything else. Um, and I kind of give my parents a hard time about that now for not forcing me to do other things. But I was so hyper focused on basketball. And my goal my whole life was to be a college basketball player. And it's all I focused my time on. It was like school, um, some friends and basketball. And I was doing everything you could imagine playing on AAU basketball teams that traveled all over the country 
participating in like strength and conditioning programs in the summer, um, spending like my summer days with my best friend in the gym working out, um, and then going to practice later at night. And and again, like literally everything I did was playing basketball. Um, and I was starting to when I was a junior in high school. I you know started to kind of develop as a basketball player in the summer between my junior and senior year. Um, I was traveling to like all these different showcases and tournaments that college coaches were watching me um, play. And, you know, again, my dream started to come true because that summer I started getting all these letters in the mail. I started getting phone calls, uh, emails, uh, my family, my parents, all these coaches were calling trying to sell us on why their school was the best place for me to go. And it was like, I was at a point in my life, I had just turned 17, you know, again, the basketball is my focus, my dream, and everything was starting to come true. So I was like, all this hard work I put in these last 10 years, um, it's all about to pay off because one of these schools I'm going to go to and one of these schools I'm going to play basketball at. So uh, that summer um, was really normal. Uh, at the end of the summer, um, and, and just to kind of take you back, quick backstory, my dad started a basketball camp before my brother and I were even born. And uh, we went to the camp every year. Uh, all our friends went. It was like the best part of the summer. And after we were too old to attend the camp as players, we became counselors at the camp. And the reason I tell you that is because later that summer, um, between my junior and senior year when I was 17, the camp was held the uh, um, the end of August, the week right before school started. So um, my brother and I, I was 17 years old, he was 13. We were both counselors at this basketball camp and we decided uh, it was Wednesday night and we decided that the next morning we wanted to wake up early. Uh, camp started at eight, so we wanted to wake up at like six and go do a basketball workout before camp started so we could enjoy the rest of, you know, enjoy the rest of the summer night after that. So the next morning, uh, August 24th, 2006, uh, my brother and I woke up 6 a.m. Uh, one of our close friends uh, picked us up, you know, like 6.30. We hopped in his car. We went over to a local prep school, um, got into the gym, and we did a basketball workout for about an hour and a half. Um, from about seven o'clock to, or I should say about 6.45 to about 8.15. So the basketball workout was completely normal. Uh, it was high intensity. We were sweating. We were, our heart rates were going up, down, up, down. It was, it was a typical workout that we would put ourselves through. And after the workout ended, we got back in his car and he dropped us off at the location where the camp was being held so we could go work. Um, and at about 8.30, I walked in. Uh, I said hi to my dad, I ordered lunch for the day, and I changed my shirt, and that is the last thing I remember from that day. So this is about 8.30 in the morning. Um, at 10.30, I was sitting on the bleachers, um, but between 8.30 and 10.30, I, again, I don't remember anything, um, but at 10.30, I was sitting on the bleachers. My best friend was sitting right next to me. Uh, my, my brother was refereeing the game on the court we were watching, and I had a bunch of kids around me. And I slumped over and basically took a face plant and went into sudden cardiac arrest right there. So as everybody here knows, uh, most likely, that the only way you can survive sudden cardiac arrest is two things have to happen. Um, you need uh, immediate CPR, and you need to be quickly shocked by an automated external defibrillator. So unfortunately, um, what happened to me, uh, nobody started CPR right away. My dad and my brother were right there. Nobody knew what to do. Nobody would even have thought something wrong, was wrong with my heart. Um, we had an athletic trainer at the camp that froze uh, because I was agonal gasping, which is a very common symptom of someone in sudden cardiac arrest, but she made the mistake and thought that um, that gasping meant I was breathing and that I did not need CPR. And the, uh, the building that I was in, uh, to this day, I still don't understand how, but they did not have an AED. It was a parks and recreation building that hosted various summer camps, various adult workout classes, and just that, tons of different activities. So people of all ages were going in and out the doors every single day, and they didn't have an AED in the building at all. Um, so as, as you all know, that those two factors made my chances to survive very, very slim. Um, I was very lucky that when they called 911, um, there was a EMT next door. He was a volunteer um, firefighter. 
and he was sitting at his desk working his, you know, nine to five day job. Uh, and he had his pager on. So when the 911 call came through, he saw the call on his pager, recognized the address, came over and um, gave me CPR. Uh, I was blue. You know, my dad uh, was, was uh, helpless because he didn't know what to do. My brother was helpless and everybody in the gym was really helpless. But this man came over and, and gave me CPR and saved my life, um, saved my brain and kept me going until the ambulance arrived and they were able to shock me with an AED. So um, I don't remember any of this. I was unconscious for a day. I don't have any memory for another day. Um, but, you know, the first night I get rushed to the hospital and, um, you know, the, a cardiologist sat down with my, with my mom and dad and they asked them a bunch of questions um, and they said that, um, you know, your son has something wrong with his heart. You know, something caused him to go into sudden cardiac arrest this morning. Uh, we need to figure out what it is. And my dad, who, you know, as a family, we, we never knew that heart disease could affect a young person. But my dad basically told the doctor that she was wrong. Um, she basically, he basically was like, no, like my son can't have heart disease because look at him. He's, he's 17, he's strong, he's healthy, he's an athlete, takes care of himself. And those type of people don't have heart disease. And we were just so unaware that, you know, the, that heart disease could affect young people at the time. Um, but I was, like I, like I said, I was unconscious for a day. I had no short-term memory for a day. And then eventually I just kind of started coming to and, and acting relatively normal. So the first things I remember in the hospital was going through every test you could ever imagine. Um, I had multiple ECGs. I had echoes, I had a cardiac catheterization, and the worst of all was I had a cardiac MRI, which was absolutely miserable for me because I don't sit still at all. And every single picture they took, they had to retake because I moved. Um, but eventually through all of this, they diagnosed me with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So my doctor came in one day and um, I love her to this day, we're still in touch, um, but she delivered probably the hardest, some of the hardest news I've ever gotten in my life. She said, you know, she had good and bad news for me. She said, uh, she kind of explained the situation. Uh, the good news is you went into sudden cardiac arrest and you survived. Um, and then she told me about the survivor rates for cardiac arrest and how low they are. And then she said, based on your circumstances with not having a CPR right away and not having an AED in the building, your chances of survivor one in a million. And she said, the bad news is, you know, we were diagnosed you with this disease and you'll never play competitive basketball again. And I'm going to get into that a little later. But when you're 17 and uh, you have nothing else, you, you think you have nothing else in, you, else in your life besides a sport. And a doctor comes in and tells you that you can no longer play that sport. It's absolutely devastating. Um, despite the fact that, you know, I almost died and I, you know, I was lucky to be alive. It still was devastating. Um, so. I spent two weeks in the hospital. They implanted a, um, an ICD, um, a transvenous ICD. This was before the subcutaneous ICD was even, I believe, invented or a thing. So, um, and then sent me home. So, you know, my life on August 23rd, 2006 was completely normal. I was a normal 17 year old kid. It was completely normal for my family. They had two really healthy young boys. Um, and then August 24th happened. And then it was a whirlwind of two weeks of news and surgery and testing and, and craziness in the hospital. And then um, two weeks later, we were home and we had to figure out kind of how to like move forward with life. And, and, uh, and that, that's what I'm kind of excited to talk to you all about today. So, um, so first thing, I'm gonna, basically the way this presentation is gonna work is I am going to talk about some of the obstacles that I had in my life, some of the feelings I've had, some of the things that I've had to overcome. Um, and I'm gonna be just as completely honest as possible because I, I'd imagine that there's people out there that have similar feelings and, and, and by no means am I trying to, um, I guess, scare anybody, but I'm just gonna be honest about things that I've gone through and how I've dealt with them and how I've gotten my life to, to where it is today. So the first thing was I, I left the hospital and I had a big, uh, big piece of metal on the left side of my chest. Um, and I didn't have that before. So, and I'm left-handed. So uh, I'm left-handed, I'm very left-handed. I don't do anything with my right hand. Um, and now all of a sudden I have a big bulge on my 
chest that um, I'm in a sling for two weeks. And the doctor's like, you know, you're going to have to figure out how to live with this thing in your chest. Um, so I dealt with a whole bunch of different issues um, with my ICD. And, and most of them were my own personal issues. Um, I was, for months, I was very stiff. I, I was struggling to use my left arm. Um, when I finally got out of the sling, um, one of the first things I wanted to do was try to shoot a basketball because I hadn't shot a basketball in, in you know, a month. Um, and I remember I was at, uh, I was actually at the place where I went into cardiac arrest. It was a gym and I took a shot and it was like 10 feet short because I felt so weak and I've had such a, of a low range of motion in that arm. Um, so I kind of was dealing with like the physical, like frustrations of like, oh my God, am I ever going to be able to use my arm again normally? Like, am I going to be this weak for the rest of my life? Am I never going to be able to shoot a basketball again? Am I never, am I going to have to figure out how to do things with my right hand? Because I, the left side of my body just isn't going to function right. And these are just all thoughts I had at, at the time. Um, and then I was dealing with the fear of being shot for no reason. Um, and fortunately that's never happened to this day, but you know, when I was in the hospital, I don't know. I remember sitting with a doctor and them telling me a couple of things. There's a chance that this thing goes off at least once in the next five years and it might not need to. And of course, my question was like, well, what's going to feel like? And their response was the only way we can explain it to you is if you feel it, it's going to feel like you're getting kicked in the chest by a horse. And again, I was like, well, that doesn't sound like it's going to feel too good. Um, so I spent a lot of my time focusing on, please don't let this ICD go off. I'm not going to do anything that's going to potentially make this ITD read my heart the wrong way. Um, so again, that, that was a month out of cardiac arrest and having an ITD implanted. Um, it took time, I will say, uh, for me to adjust to it. Um, but I have full range of motion in my arm. Um, and I did, uh, you know, within, you know, shortly after this, you know, month or two month period. Um, and today I'm happy to say that I don't even think about my ICD unless I'm talking about it like I am right now. So like on a day-to-day -day basis, I don't even realize it's there because I'm so used to living my life with it. I'm so used to doing my day-to-day -day activities. And I've talked to a lot of patients, um, older, younger, that are heading into surgery for an ICD. Um, and, and, and they have very, some of these similar fears of like, am I going to feel it every single day in my life? Is it going to affect my golf swing? Is it going to affect the activities I do, it's going to affect, you know, just the, my day-to-day -day function. And I'm happy to say that it doesn't affect mine at all. It's completely just a part of me now. It's not something I think about. It's not something I'm scared of. And it's not something um, th that, that affects my day-to-day -day life. So for those that have children that are living with an ICD or might have a new ICD implanted that might be struggling with it, um, it, it does take time, definitely but it does go away. And it's just a reminder to everybody, um, if you have questions as we go here, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an open book with this stuff. So if there's something I don't touch on that you want an answer to, ask. And don't feel like I'm gonna be uncomfortable answering. And um, you know, if you have a question that you're not comfortable asking in front of the group, um, I'll share some contact information at the end as well, if you'd like to ask on a more personal level. So the next thing I'm gonna talk about, because this was a, legit thing that I had was this fear of dying. Um, and this was the, the, the first day I came home from the hospital. I was sitting at my kitchen table and I was like, just trying to process everything that was going on. And I learned a lot about cardiac arrest when I was in the hospital. And, you know, I learned that cardiac arrest happens at any time, like, especially in, you know, my circumstances, it didn't even happen when I was exerting myself. It happened when I was just sitting still hours after a workout. Um, and doctors told me that it can happen li literally any time. And, you know, that means it can happen in your sleep. So for a couple of weeks, I had this fear that I was going to go to sleep and never wake up. Um, and, and the reason for that was because for two weeks, um, I was in a hospital and I was attached to all these wires. And as annoying as that was, the second I didn't feel right or the second I had a question or the second something started beeping, there was a nurse, a medical professional, a doctor, like right next to my bed. And that kind of comforted me. The fact that like these people were just always there. And anytime I needed them, they were there and they were going to help keep me safe. And, and that's what kind of helped me feel comfort in the hospital. Um, and then I went home 
and I love my parents to death, but neither one of them is a medical professional. Um, and, and I'm sure they want to do help um, if they needed to. But at that point in our, their life, I mean, they just spent two weeks with me. They, they weren't prepared to help me if something drastic happened. Um, so I was afraid that like something was going to happen to me and nobody was going to be around to be able to help me. And this lasted for, for I would say, you know, just a couple of months and, and I eventually got over it. But one thing that helped me get over it um, was, was my, as a family, we did CPR AED training. Um, and, and it just kind of gave me a comfort of like, okay, now like my parents are empowered to help me if they need to, rather than the situation my dad was in when I went to cardiac arrest where he didn't do anything because he didn't know. Um, and, and just doing that as a family, it was, it was quite interesting that the guy that actually saved my life is the one who, who, who gave us the training. And um, it just kind of empowered all of us and it, and, and it eased that fear that I was going to die or going to cardiac arrest and, and nobody was going to be there to, to save my life. Okay. Um, and, and this is another, a few things um, that happened early on, like right away. Um, I was dealing with uh, emotional issues, like most heart disease patients, young ones specifically deal with. Right, the anger of me being different now all of a sudden than every one of my peers, um, the anger of having the one passion in my life, basketball, being taken away from me and, and living with the reality that I'll never play in a competitive basketball game ever again. Um, with that comes depression and sadness. And, and, and a lot of these feelings, I think, um, are normal for really any person to have throughout their life. And they're definitely things that, um, that don't affect me a ton anymore. They definitely did early on. Um, the one thing I will say is I'm very, um, I, I don't sit still well, like I said before. And I think that was just like, I'm, I'm just in a constant state of like wanting to keep busy and keep occupied. And, and I really believe it might be an effect of the cardiac arrest and the heart disease and all the things that kind of, I went through emotionally with it. Um, and it still kind of affects me to this day, but um, you know, I'd imagine that, you know, again, if you're a parent and, and your child is, is, is newly diagnosed and dealing, you know, they're dealing with some of these feelings. And I, and I think that's okay. Like, I think it's okay to be angry and not think it's fair that, you know, you receive this diagnosis. Cause that's how I felt. I didn't think it was fair. Like all the, all my teammates and people that I grew up with now, they get to go on and, and keep going and I have to stop. Like that made me angry. Um, did I get over it? Yes. But it made me angry. And, um, you know, was, was I depressed that, you know, I, um, I, I wasn't able to work out and they wasn't able to do things I want to do anymore for, yeah, uh, I was a senior in high school. And I was trying to just be like a normal guy and have fun and, and get ready for college. And I was now all of a sudden dealing with, um, you know, a doctor telling me that, you know, I could go into cardiac arrest or my ICD could start shocking me again randomly. Um, and, and I dealt with all of this, but I'm, I am happy to say that, um, you know, I, I've, I've learned how to control it and I, I don't, have these feelings on a day-to-day -day basis anymore. Okay, so um, losing sports. So again, for me specifically basketball, but this is an issue that I think affects um, kids in, in a lot of different ways. Um, so when I, when I was told I'll never play basketball again, I just felt like I lost my purpose in life. Uh, I was 17 years old, small-minded, like I said before, like no balance, um, thought basketball was all there was, and felt like I had, you know, if I couldn't play basketball, I have no purpose, which obviously is not the case. But when you're 17, you just don't realize that. Um, one thing I'm going to talk about is, is something that helped me put it in perspective. And this is something I, I talk to patients and doctors and anybody I really talk to. It's something I believe in a lot. I think there's a different feeling of being, of losing sport after being diagnosed after cardiac arrest versus being diagnosed off a test. And I'm just going to explain kind of what I mean. So I was diagnosed with HCM after going to cardiac arrest, and I was told I could never play basketball again. So as angry and, um, you know, sad that I was, I still was able to somehow put it in perspective because it was like one sentence the doctor's telling me you should have died statistically. And then the next sentence, she's saying you can't play basketball. So for me, I was able to kind of put that in perspective. Um, it was hard. I'm not going to say I didn't have the, those feelings, but I think the fact that, and I would never want somebody to go into cardiac arrest, but some, I, I think the cardiac arrest helped me 
um, get over the fact that I couldn't play basketball again. And, and what I'm getting at is I think it's much more difficult to come to terms with having something taken from you when you're diagnosed off a test, whether it's a genetic test, whether it's, you know, maybe the doctor just heard something um, in a physical and they sent you for an echo and now you have HCM or whatever the condition is, and it's never affected you one day in your life. And your doctor saying you can never play hockey again. And I think it's much more difficult to come to terms with it when it happens that way. Um, of course, cardiac arrest is, is a terrible thing. Um, but I, I think from an emotional standpoint, it, it helped me um, understand this more. So, uh, you know, for those, you know, I, 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 what, I guess what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to put it in perspective of like, for a child that here's my story that sees how dangerous HCM could potentially be and how dangerous playing sport with HCM could be, potentially be, to put it in perspective for them. That this is real, that even though this hasn't affected you a day in your life, it only takes it to affect you one time to possibly, you know, to possibly kill you. Um, and, and I don't think that's an easy thing for children to understand unless it happens to them. So um, again, what I'm getting at with this is if, if, if my story could help benefit your child and help put things in perspective, I'm happy to speak with them, share with them, or, or share my story and say, hey, this, this guy was your age. And, and, and he doesn't have symptoms just like you don't, but he still went into cardiac arrest and he still almost died. And that's why you can't play sport anymore. Um, but a couple of things that helped me with like my purpose in life, um, uh, my, my mom kind of helped me with this. She, uh, she brought me to the American Heart Association I mean, that's how I kind of got involved in like volunteering and advocating. Um, because again, I, I, I felt like I had no purpose. I went to this meeting at the AHA and all of a sudden now I felt like, man, like I could help, I could share my story. I could help save other people. And it kind of made me feel like I had purpose in life. Again, the other thing that helped was I was able to stay around basketball and everybody's different here. You know, I had to make a decision. I, I, was I so angry of basketball being taken away from me that I never wanted to have it be a part of my life again? And I realized that that wasn't the case. So I went to college and I became a student manager um, and I got into coaching. And, and being a student manager allowed me to be around the game, be a part of a team, be in a pro college program. It was a great networking opportunity for me that launched my college coaching career. Um, so I think those are two ways that like if, if you are um, – you know, my, my mom kind of helped force me into finding another purpose in my life um, with the American Heart Association because I didn't initially want to go do that. She made me do it. Um, and I'm, I'm so glad now that she did. Uh, but it, it helped me realize that there is more to life than, than my sport that I played. I can't have a purpose in life still. And then, and then if, you know, if, if you get hockey or baseball or whatever sport it is taken away from you, you can still be involved in that sport in other ways. Um, and, and, and I was able to do that. And, and that's just a personal thing, but I think it's two ways to kind of like cope with, um, you know, losing sport. Okay. Um, let's see what's next. Okay. So heart disease and family. So what I'm going to talk about here is a couple of things. So, um, I kind of mentioned this at the beginning, heart disease, the diagnosis, um, it, it comes to one person and then it could come to others. Uh, at some point, but one person gets diagnosed, and in my case, I was diagnosed with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and it affected my family um, in all different ways, right? Obviously, it affected me from, I was the person going through it, but it affected my my mom and dad, because when you're a parent, you think you have ultimate control of keeping your child safe, and all of a sudden, they felt like they didn't have that control anymore. Um, the second way it uh, affected my family was genetically. Um, you know, HCM is a genetic disease. So neither of my parents were diagnosed with HCM prior to my cardiac arrest. They both got tested after. And my dad has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, at the time, he was 42 years old or 43 years old when he was diagnosed. Um, never, never had a symptom in his life. Uh, played basketball and baseball in college, basketball, baseball, football in high school. To this day, he's just turned 59. Yeah, it's just turned 59. And um, he, uh, he still has never had a symptom in his life. Um, then it affected my younger brother. My younger brother was 13 years old. And he was a basketball player as well, aspiring to play basketball in college. And 
the first thing is how is this going to affect him? And going back to what I said in the last slide, I could never imagine my brother, and thankfully he played college basketball and doesn't have the disease. Uh, but I could, you know, we, we got him tested every year and it was the worst day of the year because um, I don't know how he would have handled it if he walked into a test and they said, yeah, you have HCM now. And, and it never had affected him a day in his life because they would have they would have pulled him from sport. Um, and, and that wouldn't have been an easy thing for him to deal with. But a um, couple other ways that it affected my family. Uh, number one, we tried to do genetic testing. Uh, my gene to this day, they can't isolate it. It comes back as an unknown variance. So they cannot test my brother for it. So he still gets tested every year. He's now 27. Um, it shows no signs of it. But what I really want to talk about with this is, is more of how we all dealt with the trauma of me going into cardiac arrest because we all handled it pretty differently. Um, so I was very quiet about it. I never showed that I was hurting. I never showed my fears. I never showed my frustrations. And that's because um, I saw how it was affecting my, my parents and I didn't want them to have another um, worry on their hands. Um, my mom was very outwardly emotional about everything. She was visibly upset. She was, you know, visibly wanted to talk, she wanted to verbally talk about it. She wanted to go advocate. She wanted to, she wanted to do just, she wanted her family to go to therapy. Um, she wanted to do all these things. And, and I don't know what the right or wrong answer here was. Um, my dad was the opposite. He didn't want to talk about it. He wanted to just move on with life and, and he knew it happened. He knew we had to, we had to make some adjustments in our life here, but he didn't want to, uh, he didn't want to deal with it on a day-to-day -day basis. He obviously wanted to keep me safe, but he wanted to do that and he didn't want to speak about it. And my brother was the same way. My brother and I, uh, to this day, um, and this is, I don't think it's the healthiest thing in the world. My brother watched me at age 13, um, basically almost die. Um, and we've never said a word about it to each other and we just don't talk about it. We know it's happened, uh, but we don't, we don't speak about it. So I guess, uh, the, the, the reason why I think this slide is significant is because I think, um, when a diagnosis, uh, when, when a diagnosis happens in a family, it's a family issue. It's not just the person being diagnosed. And I think it's important, like, like for us, it was important for us to give my mom an opportunity to talk and us to listen and try therapy it didn't really go anywhere but we tried it um and she continued to do it on her own um you know and i think it's just important to respect everybody's way of handling it because we all handled it differently and uh i don't think there's a right or wrong way to do it uh, but i guess I, i'm just trying to hopefully relate to to you and your family that that you know we we, we all had different feelings and we all you know had to handle it in a different way that was best for us Okay, so weight gain. So when I was 17 years old um, and playing basketball, I could eat whatever I wanted. Uh, fast food, dessert, chips, soda, didn't matter. I burned so many calories working out. I still felt like I looked great. I still was in great shape. I was still playing like eight basketball games in a weekend. Um, and I, when I looked at myself in the mirror, I was very happy. Um, after my cardiac arrest, I was afraid to work out. Uh, I was afraid, like I talked about before, I didn't want to do anything that was going to make my ICD shock me for no reason. So didn't want to run, didn't want to exercise, didn't want to lift weights, didn't want to, didn't want to do anything. Um, unfortunately, I was not afraid to continue to eat everything in sight. So I naturally started to gain weight. And w with weight gain, you, I started looking in the mirror and saying, okay, my body looks different now. I started to lose confidence. Um, I started, you know, noticing that my peers uh, were in better shape than me all of a sudden and, and their bodies looked better than mine. And I was a senior in high school and we had swim class, uh, the high school I went to. And I was so embarrassed about how I looked that I told the, and I, I hate to do this, but I, I, I told the teacher that uh, my doctors didn't want me swimming right now. So I'd have to take off my shirt in front of everybody. Um, because, you know, I told him it was because of my heart. And, and it was just a really embarrassing time for me because I went from being this, like, you know, athletic, tall, lean basketball player to now I'm, like, felt like I had gained, I, at my peak, I had gained about 30 pounds. So I was, like, you know, much heavier than I was when I was playing basketball. So, you know, and it started to affect my everyday life, how I dress, 
who I change in front of, whether I go swimming in my own swimming pool at home with my friends. Um, do I want to go to the beach with my friends? No, because then I'm going to have to take off my shirt. And, and these things add up, you know, the emotional um, toll that this feeling takes on you starts to add up. So it, it had a huge effect on my life gaining weight. And I got to a point where I was like, I have to figure out how to get this under control. I have no idea how to do it, but I'm going to try to figure it out and get it under control. So I went to my doctor and she suggested I do cardiac rehab because cardiac rehab would give me an idea of how to start working out again. So I did cardiac rehab. I signed up and I hated it more than anything at first because I walked in and I was the youngest person in the room by like 40 years. Um, they told me to hop on a treadmill, which I've done millions of times in my life. And they set it to like the speed to two. And they said, okay, walk. And they then they um, they said, okay, it's time to start lifting weights. And they handed me like five pound dumbbells. And I remember being like, this is terrible because this is not how I want to live my life. Um, uh, you know, two months ago, I was like squatting, bench pressing, doing all these intense workouts. And now I'm walking on a treadmill and nothing against the people, but the guy next to me is like, 80 years old and doing the same thing I'm doing and and I'm 17 and, and this doesn't seem right um but I, I looking reflecting back on it now um I stuck it out I did the cardiac rehab and cardiac rehab was the best thing I've ever done um because it just kind of got me comfortable working out I was able to you know eventually they let me do a little more and a little more and I was hooked up and I was being monitored and they could see my heart rate and my heart rhythms and they could ensure that I was doing everything safely so it empowered me to now be able to go do it on my own to go to the YMCA or go to the gym and, and, and do some cardio and do some light weight lifting. And I'm going to talk about in the next slide, kind of what I do for workouts. Um, but, it, but cardiac rehab is something I suggest um, as frustrating as it might be for a child, because I really think that it kind of empowers you to, uh, to learn what you can do and, and what you can do, uh, do safely. So, um, and on top of that, I kind of learned balance. Like, um, do I eat a perfect diet? Uh, no, to this day, I still do not. I still enjoy life and enjoy things, but I have balance with what I eat. Like I try to cut certain things out of my diet and you know, I was 17, I'm eight or 18. I'm, you know, I'm a kid. Like you're, you're want, you want to go hang out with your friends and get fast food. But I started to cut out certain things like soda and bread and, and, or limit my bread intake and, and limit my dessert intake. And, and slowly I started to kind of gain control of my life back. Cause because with that weight gain, that, that's the best way to describe it. I felt like I kind of like lost control of myself physically and, and it hurt me emotionally. Um, but between the cardiac rehab and, and kind of learning how to have some balance with my diet, um, it, it allowed me to get that control back. All right. So next, um, I'm going to talk about working out. So today, um, age 31, I... Um, I have a pretty normal workout regimen. When I first was diagnosed with heart disease and had an ICD implanted, my doctors were very adamant about me not lifting weights. Um, and I think the reason for that was because they didn't trust the fact that I was going to do it properly. Um, now, I, with COVID, I haven't been to a gym in a long time, but I, so I haven't done much weight training. Um, but, you know, I do, I do light weight training. Um, I make sure that um, I'm never struggling to get a rep up. So I'll never put too much weight on the bar to the point where I'm struggling and putting a ton of strain in my heart and can't push it out. Um, so I'd never need someone's spot for me because I'm never going to be putting up weight like that. And um, so I'm, I'm very careful about weight training. I do it. I do it in moderation probably for someone that's you know, a 31-year-old guy, but I still do do it when I, when I have it, you know, when it's accessible to me. Um, cardio. Um, and again, I just want to say this about working out. I, this is me 14 years after sudden cardiac arrest and, and 14 years of learning my body and how to do things. Um, and, and it works for me and, and it's not necessarily going to be the case for everybody, but um, this is just kind of what I do. But cardio um, right now, it's not a COVID hit. I've been in like a running phase. So I run, you know, I run three to four miles a day. Um, I think it's a great workout for someone with heart disease because um, you're not constantly spiking your heart rate. You kind of get your heart rate up and you keep it at a certain level and then you stop and it goes back down rather than going up, down, up, down, up, down, like happens when you sprint. Um, I love biking. 
doing other cardio, you know, other types of cardio. But I'm, uh, I would say the best way I, to explain it is that um, I'm never in a situation where I don't think I would be able to have a conversation with someone next to me. So I'm never so out of breath. And because people have asked me, well, how do you measure it? Um, I used to measure it with like a watch and looking at my heart rate. But now I measure it by like, if I'm ever at a point where I'm pushing myself so hard that I can't talk to the person next to me, I know I'm probably pushing myself too hard. Um, and then sports. So, um, you know, I, I do various things that are safe. I play golf. Uh, I play tennis. I, I do things, you know, I, I have played some pickup basketball. I'm very careful about it. I don't do it much, to be honest. And I don't suggest that you do it unless you doctor kind of um, gives you the okay to do it. Um, but, you know, for the most part, I'm like non-contact sports is, is the sports that I'm doing. Okay, um, so I, you know, um, college. So this was a big thing for me. I, I'm keeping a track of the time here. I know we're, we're getting about 15 minutes left um, or less. So we have time for questions, but um, I struggled with the college decision. I went to college the, 10 minutes down the road from my house. It was a great school, Quinnipiac University, but um, I just was afraid to move far away. And I was unsure of a lot of things that college kids do, um, like drinking and, and smoking and, and doing things. And, and I didn't do these things. Um, I, I, don't, I don't smoke. And I, people have asked me this question, you know, uh, other patients, you know, how, how does smoking weed affect your heart? Um, personally, I don't smoke weed. Um, I don't suggest it for someone with heart disease, um, but I don't know how it would uh, affect because I've never done it. I do drink alcohol socially. Um, I was really scared about it at first, but I'm, I'm careful about it. And I drink socially like a normal uh, adult drinks. Um, and, and, you know, the other fear I had with college is going away. Like you, like I had this, you know, the fear of who's keeping you safe. You go from doctors and nurses to being around your family. And now all of a sudden you go off to college and it's like, who's going to keep me safe? So um, looking back on it, it was a, it was an interesting time in my life. I wish I was more comfortable to go further away from home, but at the time of my life, I just wasn't, um, wasn't, didn't feel comfortable and able to do that. Um, relationships, um, significant others, families, friends. Um, I think the most important thing for someone with heart disease is to be honest with them. Um, because, and the reason for that is because the reality is that your friends and family, your significant other needs to know what to do if something happens. And um, if these people in your life can't handle knowing that you have heart disease and can't handle being prepared to help you, then they're probably not people that should be in your life. And I've been open and honest. It hasn't affected any of my relationships that I, that I know of. Um, I don't know if certain people have thought certain ways about me. Um, but you know, I, my friends and family know that you know, I have heart disease. I went into cardiac arrest once. The reality is I could go into cardiac arrest at some other point in my life and they might have to step in and provide CPR. And, you know, if my ICD doesn't shock me right away, use an AED on me and call 911 and, and do all that. Um, so I think it's important to um, be around people that support you and support um, you as a person, support your heart disease and, and want to help you if, if, if they need to. Um, so. Um, that question's come up a lot. Like, does it affect your dating life? And um, for me, for me personally, it, it hasn't because I've been honest. And if someone is freaked out by it or if someone's not comfortable by it, that's totally fine. That's probably not the person that I should be with. Um, and that's that's kind of the, the way the way dating goes. But um, and same thing with like your your peer relationships and your friends. You know, if someone isn't comfortable being around you, then they're they're probably not one of your one of your true friends. A um, couple other things. Um, I'm not going to touch on this because we're it's for too long. Um, so I had an ICD replacement. Um, I had open heart surgery when I was 25, and um, that picture is. Uh, I joked. I spoke at the CCF conference, and um, I have no clue why my mom thought it was a good idea to take this picture, but she did, and I use it because it's a pretty powerful picture. Um, so I had open heart surgery when I was uh, 20, uh, 25. Um, I, I had an ICD replacement eight years out, which is normal. Um, and I'll be, I'll be honest about it. And this isn't, again, nothing I say, I, I'm trying to scare people. I'm just trying to be completely honest. Um, one of the risks with surgery is catching an infection. 
very, 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 very low risk that that happens in surgery. It happened to me when I had my ICD replaced, which led to a lead extraction, which led to open heart surgery. These things are all very, very rare. Um, once you have an ICD placed, it is pretty common. Um, you know, you're gonna have to get replaced every eight years. They're very, very um, routine surgeries that can done a lot. Um, and it's not something that needs to be worried about. But what I wanna talk about here really quickly is I now have a subcutaneous ICD um, and I, I got it eight years after, so I was 25. And at first I was really, really um, nervous about it because I had lived and gotten used to my lifestyle with my transvenous ICD. Um, and I was super scared to do something different because I thought I was gonna have to adjust. Um, but the, the reason I'm talking about this is because um, my suggestion as, uh, for parents is if your child is um, in need of an ICD and doctors are saying they're gonna put one in to see if they qualify for a subcutaneous ICD. Um, and I, I would imagine most doctors are at least checking that. It, it only works with, there is a test and I don't know the science behind it, but there's certain rhythms that don't qualify for it. Um, but I think it's worth checking uh, because I like the subcutaneous ICD more now. Um, it's, it's different. The wires don't go directly into my heart muscle, which if you do have to do a lead extraction, it makes that surgery much safer. Um, it's also tucked uh, under my left armpit and it's a little more out of the way. It's kind of like in between my, my, um, uh, my chest, it's, it's a little further back, almost toward my back. So it's really out of the way. Um, and, and if, again, if your child is um, in need of an ICD, my suggestion would be to ask if they qualify for a subcutaneous ICD. Okay. All right. So um, I'm going to talk really quick. Uh, I know if you want to take a picture of this slide, um, this is my personal information. So um, my email, micahandheartbeat.org. My cell phone, uh, 203-980-3599. You can feel free to use either of those, call, email, text. Um, I know we're gonna do a section for questions at the end, but a lot of times that I've learned, I've, I've spoken at some different conferences, not um, everybody is super comfortable asking your question in front of others. And like I said before, I am totally open to answering anything. Um, if it's something I haven't experienced, I'll be honest and tell you that. But feel free to ask anything or encourage your child to ask anything. Um, one of my passions and something I believe in, and I'm gonna talk real quick about in a heartbeat, but this third bullet down, the patient support program, I truly believe in that. I truly believe in you know, connecting with other patients um, and, and, and allowing them to, to, to teach you, right? Because your medical team consists of great doctors, brilliant, brilliant people that are gonna guide you um, I think the next piece of that is also having someone that's already lived through what you're living through. Um, and, and, and looking back on it now, I think about how beneficial 17 year old me, um, it would have been to, to have somebody that was like 25 or 30 that could relate to me and say, okay, I've done this, this is what I've done. Or I could reach out and say, hey, like, you know, I don't know, like when you went to college and drank like, or, or anything like that, when you, when you work out, how much you do, like, it would have been great to kind of have a, um, a a mentor, I guess, per se, in that regard. And I'm happy to help any child that, that needs that, because um, it's something I truly believe in. But real quick, um, like um, we mentioned before, um, in a heartbeat, uh, if any of the programs that we have can help you in any way, please let us know. We donate AEDs. Uh, we've donated 135 of them. We do CPR, AED training with that. We help set up emergency action plans. We help fund HCM research projects, um, patient support I've talked about. Um, we do have an online forum, but it's mostly like more individual uh, uh, with, with me or, or with my, my mom who um, loves supporting other moms that are, that are living through this diagnosis and, and trying to figure it out. Um, and then we're also doing some cardiac screening here in Connecticut where we're going to be um, offering EKGs to um, children, teens, and young adults. So again, if you want to take a picture of the slide, please feel free. I'm happy to, uh, to talk to anybody at any time. Um, and I'm just gonna give some final thoughts here. So the biggest thing I think about heart disease is that it's about you um, or, or your child as a patient. And, and really like, they need to 
figure out and you, you know, me as a heart disease patient, the biggest thing that helped me was to stop comparing myself to other people. Um, and I'm, I'll give a quick example of it. So, um, and working out was the easiest way I can kind of think of an example. So when I work out now, when I worked out prior, it was all about pushing myself and being competitive and being better than the next guy. And, and, um, you know, if I felt dizzy, you know, I'm supposed to feel this way because I'm working out. When I work out now, it's completely different. I'm working out to be healthy. Um, but I work out with my brother a fair amount. My brother does not have HCM. He played division one basketball at Boston university and he is an incredible athlete. If me and my brother work out together, I am not as strong as him. Um, I don't lift as much weight as him. I'm not as fast as him. I'm not uh, conditioned in a, in a cardio sense as much as he is. And I don't try to be, I don't try to keep up with him. I don't try to like necessarily think I need to be as in good shape as my brother. Cause if I did, um, it would probably have a negative effect on me and I'd be pushing myself too hard. So the big thing about heart disease is it's about you. It's about nobody else. It's about learning your body, learning what you can do, learning what you can handle, learning how hard you can do things. Um, and then the three things I think like to, to, to benefit your life is um, number one, listen to your doctors. Um, doctors are brilliant. Doctors have, you know, do research. They, they have studies. They, they, they publish documents and, and, and they're, they're there to help you. They're there to guide you. They're there to give you um, guidance on what you can and can't do every day. And, and ultimately doctors are, are the people that are going to keep you safe. Um, learn from other patients like I talked about. Talk to other patients, learn about things they've done, um, learn about things they didn't do, learn about things maybe they've done that have had a negative effect and, and listen to other patients. And finally, like I was getting at before is listen to your body and learn from it. Like for me, it's been 14 years of trying to figure this out. And, and I'm really happy to say that I have a really normal life right now. Um, it took time for me to get there, but it took me like listening to my body and trusting it and trusting my ICD and trusting my doctors and, and, and feeling what feels right to me um, and, uh, and, and navigating my life that way. So um, with that, um, if anybody has any questions, I would be happy to, uh, to answer them. Um, if not, again, I, I'm happy to, um, to answer them on more of a personal level if you prefer that. Hi, Mike. So I, we do have a couple of questions um, that, that cool. um, some of our participants um, submitted. One is, um, have you ever yeah. been shocked since, you, um, since your ICD was implanted? Yeah. Um, so no, I have not. Um, I've never been shocked uh, once, thankfully. Okay. All right. Thank you. Did your, um, did your doctor recommend cardiac rehab or did you do that on your own? Yeah. Yeah. So um, she, uh, it was my pediatric cardiologist that recommended it and found a place for me. I, I don't know if it, like she had to prescribe it or, or how that went down. Just that was, you know, my, to be honest, my, my mom was handling all that at that point in my life. Um, but, uh, but yes, it was, it was a suggestion for my doctor. She found the, the place to do it and uh, kind of set me up there and, and, uh, and yeah, that's how it went. Okay. Um, and just the last thing was more of a comment. Um, um, one of the participants wanted to know, um, you know, she wants to play this for her son and um, wanted to know if this was going to be recorded anywhere. So I just want to make the comment that um, yeah. it, it will be available um, and um, it will be on our um, CCF uh, uh, Heart Kids YouTube channel. And um, you can, you can, uh, it will probably be up by tomorrow, um, but I will send all the participants that information. Um, I just got another question that came in. Um, let me see. Yeah. Um, what is the measurement of your septal? Has it increased? So I don't know the measurement, but I do know it has not increased. Um, thankfully, my mind stayed pretty st steady. Every, every year when I get an echo, um, uh, nothing's changed at all. Um, I should know. I should know the measurement, um, but I, I don't know it all, all off the top of my head. Okay. All right. I think that's it for for all the questions. If anybody else wants to shoot a quick quick question right now, um, we have a couple minutes. If not, um, Mike has um, graciously shared his um, uh, 
phone and email address. I think we do have another question. Oh no, it was just a thank you. <laughs> um, so we don't have any other questions. Um, so Mike, I, I really want to thank you. This was great. Um, your, um, your, you know, we really appreciate that you share your story, um, and and more importantly, we really appreciate that your your honesty um, with all of this. Um, it's it's really helpful. Um, just a reminder to everybody that is is on um, that September is Children's Cardiomyopathy Awareness Month. Um, CCF is sharing awareness activities and information throughout the whole month. Uh, we'll be hosting a virtual walk um, to support CCF's initiative th throughout the month. So just go to our website and you can have a quick look to see um, more information. Our website is childrenscardiomyopathy.org. Um, and then for those of you who just want to take a, a quick look tomorrow, the, this recording will be on our YouTube channel and um, it is called CCF Heart Kids. And I think, let me just see if I just got another question. Nope. Mike, you're getting lots of nice um, comments from everybody. Everyone's saying thank you. Oh, um, <laughs> this yeah. was really great. And I want to thank you for being part of this. And I want to thank everybody who um, were participants today in this presentation. Um, we really appreciate it. I hope you all have a great day. And Mike, thanks again so much. Yeah. Take care. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.